June 19, 2001. Only a few days shy of the 10th anniversary of the series that had taken Sega to the top of the industry. But all of that was so long ago, though it was dearly beloved, the dream was already dead. And so, is a celebration of everything he had been, everything he had meant, and everything he had done, Sonic the Hedgehog would appear on Sega hardware for the very last time. It was the end of an era. February 11th, 2002. For the first time, Sonic appeared on a console of which he was not the mascot, on the home system of the very company that he was specifically created to rival. And yet, this game would be the origin of a new generation of Sonic fans. Their first impression would shape the future of this series for years to come. It was the beginning of a new era. This is Sonic Adventure 2. Over the past few years, there's been a bit of a misconception brewing around this game. Lately, every time I've seen somebody criticize Sonic Adventure 2, it's met with this idea that jaded gamers are only hating on it now, in retrospect, and they're being unfair to it because back in the day, everybody thought it was this amazing, wonderful game, it was really the best Sonic game ever, and just no. Where are people getting this? This narrative just does not describe Sonic Adventure 2's reception not among the gaming press, and especially not within Sonic fandom. Right from the word go, this was a strikingly divisive game that made the Flame Wars of the 90s look like minor little squabbles in comparison. There had just never been such a love-it-or-hate-it Sonic game, and seeing people respond to it this way was, well, perplexing. Because here I thought we were all on the same page. I thought we were all hyped for Sonic Adventure 2. From the day the first screenshots came out around E3 2000, I had never stopped trying to find more. I had never stopped following every lead I could, digging through page after page of message board speculation, and spending hours on end very slowly downloading real player videos that had all the clarity and resolution of a postage stamp. Still, I would squint my eyes and just get blown away by how spectacular this all looked, how much more detailed the characters were, the fact that we were going to get to play as Eggman, the way that truck would send cars flying in real time. And then at the very end, this single shot of this mysterious black hedgehog. Man, that was a long, tough year to be a Sega fan. As the sun started to set on the Dreamcast and on the Sega of old, the mere idea of Sonic Adventure 2 came to mean so much to me. I knew it wasn't going to happen, but I used to daydream about the game coming out and being so revolutionary that it somehow saved the Dreamcast. For all intents and purposes, this would be Sega's swan song. It would be the capstone of an era, saying sayonara to these innovative daredevils that had made me a gamer. So with so much on the line, I just knew that Sonic Team would not let us down. Sonic Adventure 2. You either loved it or you hated it. And me? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I seriously thought it was the most awesome game I had ever played. So yeah, when I got online and saw people complaining about it, it didn't make any sense. How could anyone not love this? It made such a stellar impression right from the very first level, right from the very first cutscene. A military helicopter makes its way through a bright blue sky. We never see the soldiers, but we hear their radio chatter, as they suddenly panic and report that a hedgehog has escaped and taken out everybody aboard. But even though a fugitive is knocking out soldiers, the mood doesn't seem sinister, as a playful guitar riff builds up throughout the scene. Right as it kicks into this terrifically carefree remix of Sonic's theme from the last game, True Blue himself blasts out onto the wing, flips up, and throws out one of his signature braggadocious quips. Talk about low-budget flights! No food or movies! I'm out of here! He propels himself down to the city below, the camera hanging there with him just long enough for him to smirk directly into it. From there we break dynamically into gameplay, into a stage that's every bit as iconic as Green Hill was a decade before. You probably know what's about to happen, but what may be a little harder to get your head around is why it was something special. Let me put this one in context. Ten years earlier, Sonic 1 started out in the naturalistic, yet stylistically surreal, Green Hill Zone. 
The stages that followed had a variety of archetypes, but each zone always had this stylistic throughline that was, for lack of a better term, very 90s. As Sonic made his way deeper into the game, the zones progressively showcased more and more signs of structure and urbanization, and it all culminated in the heart of Robotnik's empire, a factory the size of the city, spewing untold waste and pollution into the environment. The series going forward would iterate on this, of course, but it would never totally break from it. Even in Sonic Adventure 1, the zones for the most part still feel like traditional Sonic levels, and really, seeing them in 3D only makes them seem even more surreal. So, all of this, this is what Sonic was. Now show me City Escape. The reason this stage is so iconic, the reason everyone remembers it, is because of how relentlessly and immediately it hits you with all these distinct elements that are not just excellent on their own, but completely different from what had come before. This time the game is starting in a city, beginning where it used to end, but there's nothing twisted or evil about it. Despite retaining familiar elements like sloping walls and loops, the environmental design is a lot more detailed and realistic than it ever could have been in the previous decade. Sonic Team had mastered the Dreamcast hardware by this point, and so this was one of the first 3D games that I ever saw hit 60 frames per second. I didn't even know that term at the time, but I could feel the difference, and it made this the smoothest, most phenomenal looking game I had ever seen. But the visuals are only half the story. The other half of what gives City Escape such a strong thematic identity is that theme song. You have just enough time to appreciate the aesthetic. You're about to hit that first hairpin turn, and then this happens. Music in Sonic games to this point had been all about enhancing and complementing the zone. The themes were varied, catchy, melody-driven, and just awesome video game music. <laughs> but this wasn't even trying to sound like video game music. As inseparable as this song is from the stage, it's not trying to sell or enhance the environment, no. This song is selling you on the character of Sonic. The industry was going through something of an awkward adolescence. The surrealism necessitated by pixel art was by this point seen as kitschy and outdated. The ever-increasing power of 3D hardware meant gamers demanded more realistic, cohesive worlds. After all, we didn't want to be playing with cartoony toys for children, even if the game did happen to star anthropomorphic talking animals. The point is, just as this was meant to be the epitome of cutting-edge cool in the early 90s, this is pure, unfiltered 2001 in video game form. I'm serious. You say summer of 2001, and this is exactly what I picture. Right down to the soap shoes. The previous game may have introduced this design, but Sonic Adventure 2 is where modern Sonic really came into focus. Even the jump sound effect is this realistic <laughs> instead of a goofy <laughs> This game breaks the mold the series was in for so long, casting away its 16-bit conceits and reinventing it as something more contemporary. The Sega of old may be gone, but with the Dreamcast's dying breath, Sonic Team has made its mascot new again. So as of right now, it's June 22nd, 2001, and after three solid days with Sonic Adventure 2, I have never been more excited or optimistic for the future of this franchise, because by all indications, the best is yet to come. Oh, wait. Something's wrong here. I mean, there's kind of a lot I'm leaving out, right? I mean, yeah, I've played it for three days straight, but I haven't even finished it yet because I just can't tear myself away from the speed stages. Is, uh... Is it really that incredible? No. I'm sorry, but I've got to be more than just nostalgic this time. To be clear, there is absolutely nothing wrong with nostalgia. But here's the thing. When I was doing a video on the Dreamcast, all I really needed to do was tell you what it was like at the time. This game's a little different. There is assuredly no shortage of people who can tell you way better than I can what it was like to play Sonic Adventure 2 as a kid. Although, let's be real, most of them remember this title screen a little differently. Because early in 2002, the game was ported to the Nintendo GameCube as Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. The response in the online community was sort of a collective, eh? We had spent six months squabbling over it, and all there really was left to do was make jokes like, Oh wow, the game is so much better now that Sonic has rounder ears. Truly the power of the GameCube knows no bounds. But me, I was so firmly on the side of loving it that I couldn't wait for the port. That extra word in the title referred to a massive upgrade to the multiplayer mode. Now that was a big part of why the Dreamcast release had kept me coming back, and the GameCube port added tons of new stages and features. 
Now yeah, it also got rid of a very critical playable character, and didn't include any of the DLC costumes, but the prospect of finally being able to destroy Kaelin and City Escape made this a justifiable loss. Single player was barely changed, but I was ready to play it again anyway. The GameCube release received pretty harsh scores from critics of the day, perhaps an early sign that the series would face an uphill battle outside of the old Sega stronghold. But with hindsight, I think we can say that neither the critical response or the online fandom's apathy really made a difference here. Sonic Adventure 2 Battle became the best-selling non-Nintendo game on the GameCube, selling over 2.5 million copies. If this was your first Sonic game, it's statistically very unlikely that you played it on the Dreamcast. That means it was essentially the first Sonic game for two demographics where the GameCube dominated the hardcore Nintendo faithful, and a new generation of young gamers. That means that Sonic Adventure 2 Battle broke the fan base between an old-school crew that grew up with Sega and a younger contingent who had little to no memory of Sega as a console maker. And it broke that base hard, because it itself was such a break from what the series had been before. SA2 did away with the first game's adventure fields, and moved progression back to a zone-to-zone -zone track. There was also a lot of whining, when early material only showed three playable characters, whereas the first game had six. Defending these changes, it was the first of many, 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 many times that Sonic Team claimed they were trimming the fat and bringing Sonic back to his roots. Which is funny, because this game is anything but a nostalgic throwback, but I digress. Sonic Adventure's overly ambitious design was the result of the insane pressure that Sonic Team was under to deliver this all-encompassing killer app for the Dreamcast. The expectations of the late 90s demanded more playable characters, more modes and features, and what 3D platformer would be complete without a hub world to run around in. It's no surprise that a lot of those elements were long in the tooth, even just a few years after release. So Sonic Team was right to streamline the sequel. Although, technically, Adventure 2 actually does have just as many characters as the first game, only with half as many gameplay styles. The story mode is split into a hero path and a dark path, and the whole game is defined by this dichotomy. So let's briefly get into the story. Now, if you know me, it probably isn't a surprise that this is the first time since 2001 that I've really paid much attention to it. And if you're like me, then you probably really hate when a game doesn't let you skip the story. So if you're more interested in hearing me break down the game's mechanics, go ahead and skip to the time code on screen. Wait, 2358? I said I was gonna briefly get into the story! No! Fifty years ago, Robotnik's grandfather was commissioned by the government to work on a top-secret weapon, but the project ended in a mysterious catastrophe. Our modern-day Eggman finds out about it from his grandpa's diary, following the clues to discover that Stan is not what he seems, and that his grandfather's ultimate weapon is still held under guard in a military base. The bad doctor infiltrates the base, and what he finds doesn't seem to be a weapon at all. No, it's a dark hedgehog named Shadow who declares himself the ultimate life form. Yeah, he's basically gonna take Knuckles' old spot as the Vegeta to Sonic's Goku from here on. Shadow directs Eggman to an abandoned space colony, the Ark, where he reveals that Eggie's grandpappy really did make an ultimate weapon, the Eclipse Cannon. By harnessing the power of the Chaos Emeralds, it can destroy entire planets, and that sure sounds familiar. I guess the egg doesn't fall too far from the chicken. Hmm. So, Team Dark wants to use this weapon to threaten the world to bend to Eggman's will, and it's up to Team Sonic to stop that from happening. One thing I remember being really impressed about was how much better animated and expressive the characters were, especially compared to SA1, where characters gesticulated their eyebrows in different directions. Now, I'm not saying for a second that this stuff holds up to modern scrutiny. <laughs> characters' mouth flaps still don't always match what they're saying, but I don't know, I couldn't really see that on a CRT. Take my word for it, in 2001 this game was gorgeous, and it helps that everybody just feels so much more in character. Sonic never stands still. Even when he gets captured, he can't stop moving. His 3D model was a much better match for his new modern artwork, and honestly, seeing it like this finally made it work for me. He just looks awesome. The game captures his personality well, too. He's sure-footed and cocky, but he doesn't think before he acts. The crux of the story really revolves around Shadow, the mystery of where he came from, and this internal struggle to come to terms with what happened 50 years ago. I'm actually not going to get too much into that in this video. 
there will probably be a better opportunity for all that later. For now, let's just say that I think it was cool how Shadow was this dark counterpart to our hero, who takes himself very seriously as he skates around on edgy rollerblades. You laugh because I'm different. I laugh because you're all the same. Knuckles got a new voice actor, and I get that he's supposed to be stoic, but sometimes he's just so wooden. Yeah, we'll see about that, Batgirl. It's weird, right? The animation doesn't match the line rating. Compare this to the first game. No time for games, Sonic! Give me the emeralds you have, right now! There, Knuckles' voice actor captured his character as a well-intentioned loner who's just a bit of a dope. The new voice actor eventually starts having fun with the role a little more. Take this! But it's pretty inconsistent. Ah, but here's a plus. This game is the last time for a very long time that Knuckles is actually even going to be acknowledged as the guardian of the Master Emerald. Rouge the Bat makes her debut, and, well, you know, this character design didn't have quite the repercussions in 2001 that it would today. Like with a lot of quote-unquote sexy anthropomorphic characters, this stuff just kind of makes me uneasy. Ah, no, she wasn't nearly that bad. Plot-wise, though, I think she's a little tacked on. Knuckles and Rouge both kind of suffer from this, because there's a lot of times when they're kind of off doing their own thing, but I think Rouge gets it worse. She likes jewels, she's skilled at espionage, she's some kind of double agent for the military, but even that has little bearing on the plot, and if memory serves, it never comes up again. But hey, at least the game series finally got a second playable lady, so I guess I'll take it. Tails is back, and the story does a really nice job following up on his character art from the last game. In other words, Tails does believe in himself, and this self-confidence gives him agency that he didn't have before. He's not solely reliant on Sonic anymore, and his intellect and abilities let him play a critical role in coming up with plans for the hero side. Narratively, he's a great contrast to Dr. Eggman. In terms of gameplay, though, eh, let's put a pin in that. Robotnik himself has embraced the Eggman name since Sonic Adventure 1, and there was a ton of novelty of playing as the series villain. The late Dean Bristow did a phenomenal job capturing how threatening, cunning, and ridiculous Eggman is. It's cool how this plot is driven more by character motivations and relationships, instead of just Eggman stumbling upon some ancient prophecy. I remember really loving this overarching narrative at the time, and you know what? I think I still do. But here's the problem. While the plot holds up on paper, the individual story beats and presentation... Well, that's where I've got some issues. Let me give you an example. At one point, Team Dark wants to steal Chaos Emeralds from a military facility, then trigger the island that facility is on to explode so they can cover their tracks. The heist is going well, until Rouge is captured by military agents and locked in a vault. She radios to Shadow, panicking that she's stuck in there with the Emeralds. But the Emeralds are not what Shadow is concerned with. Instead, he remembers a girl named Maria, who was his friend 50 years ago. He still seems to feel guilt and remorse over what happened to her, and he won't let the same fate befall Rouge. With newfound determination, Shadow cuts through the forest and warps Rouge out just in time. Narratively speaking, this is the first clue that Shadow may be more of a hero than he appears. This all looks good on paper, but in actual execution, we never even see Rouge get captured. In one scene, you play as her to defeat a boss. In the very next moment, she's trapped! And while Shadow's character moment plays well in subtext, the way it actually plays is, well... The moment is lampshaded to a ridiculously cheesy degree, and ends with Shadow cutting off his own line and spouting nonsense. And this is not an isolated incident. A while later, Rouge radios in to report her findings on Project Shadow. Ooh, that's intriguing. Is she a double agent? Maybe she has her own ulterior motives for wanting to team up with Eggman. But who cares about any of that? Let's cut with no explanation to Rouge driving a car themed after herself down a ridiculous sky highway. Awkward non sequiturs like this are all over the game. Oh, yep, Sonic and Shadow sure do look alike, don't they? It'd be hard not to get them confused. I mean, Amy's the biggest Sonic fangirl there is, and even she can't tell them apart. Oh, no, Rouge slipped and is falling, but Knuckles catches her just in time. Oh, too bad she doesn't have wings. This certainly is an important and well-rounded character who is totally not just 
just here to muddle up the plot and justify a driving section? What are you even the president of? Uh-oh, Shadow finds out Rouge is a government spy and accuses her of being that agent Rouge the Bat. But wait, if she's that well-known, how could he have not made the connection before? Oh, uh, yeah, Amy and Knuckles totally saw Eggman go into the pyramid. I mean, we the audience didn't see it happen, but let's just take their word for it. Sonic, you are right there. We didn't see how you got there, but you have everything you need to sabotage the Eclipse Cannon right now. But no! He's just gonna stand there while I play another stage, completely ignore the weapon that is threatening the planet, and then go off to save Amy. Sonic Adventure 2's cutscenes also feature some pretty dire sound mixing. Voices are too often mixed under the music, characters infamously interrupt and talk over each other. The English voice actors weren't directed to match their time into the Japanese dub, but in other cases, the script itself is sloppy. Shadow has this signature move called Chaos Control, where he uses an emerald to, uh, well, sometimes it freezes time, sometimes it makes the user teleport, and sometimes it's a projectile. The game's not really clear on it. Anyway, there's a scene where this enormous monster called the Bio Lizard uses Chaos Control control, which is an indication that it might be related to Shadow somehow. So when he sees this, Shadow is supposed to react with surprise. Was that Chaos Control? But no, instead the line was translated as, Is that what Chaos Control is? Yet despite not always being timed or translated well, the English voice cast was seemingly directed to sound exactly like their Japanese counterparts in certain situations. Tidia! Yosh, Yosh, Yosh. I guess this sounded natural in Japanese, but it's pretty off-kilter in English. And near the end, even the core of the plot falls apart. Shadow's turn to the good side is predicated not on his own sense of morality, but on Amy, of all people, jogging his memory, reminding him that 50 years ago, Maria didn't ask him to take revenge on the people of Earth. No, she wanted him to give them a chance to be happy. This means that everything Shadow does, good and bad, is based on what he thinks someone else wants, instead of his character being resolved by who he is. Also, the story doesn't really capitalize on its potential as well as it could. Whittling the number of stories down to two was the right move. At least you no longer have to watch some of the same story events play out six times. But there were a lot of cool things that could have been done by seeing the same story from two sides. And yet the game only really tries this one time. And by the way, when I saw that section for the first time, I was playing the dark story. And being 13, I genuinely kind of thought that because I'd done that story first, the game had killed off its title character. Farewell, Sonic. Forever. But actually, in the end, it turns out it's Shadow that dies. And you know, despite how fast his turn was, this anti-hero sacrificing himself, having fulfilled his promise, actually was a really poignant moment, and a fitting end for the character. Except, of course, it wasn't the end, and by the way, what even killed him? And whatever it was, why didn't Sonic also die? He and Shadow were in identical circumstances, and seriously, this has always bugged me. Anyway, it's easy to criticize this stuff now, but the truth is, the presentation issues didn't really take much away in 2001. On the contrary, the internet had made me enough of a wannabe otaku that a game that sounded so obviously, so fortuitously translated from Japanese was just really cool. I saw the plot as a darker, more mature, more sophisticated story that was age-appropriate for a real gamer like me. I mean, I... I was a man now, and Sonic had grown up with me. This time around, I enjoyed the story for being campy, charming, taking itself way too seriously, and generally being anime as heck. The overall narrative does hold up, and in fact, this may still be the best quote-unquote serious story the game series has ever done. Not that that's saying much, but it does prove that it's possible for a Sonic game to present a more epic, dramatic plot without losing sight of who its characters are. No matter how high the stakes get, Sonic is still Sonic, and what you see is what you get. Uh, well, so much for being brief. You know, maybe that says something, though. A lot of times when I'm approaching a game to make a video about it, I end up noticing and kind of appreciating things that I might ignore if I was just playing it for myself. I'm not typically a story gamer, and I didn't think I'd have much to say about the plot, but the fact that there's so much more of it to sink your teeth into is, no doubt, something that a lot of the people who love this game love about it. But all that being said, let's get back to what I really loved about it. The speed stages. I wasn't kidding earlier. I really do think that this was the first time they made Sonic really work in 3D. But what I didn't see in 2001 was that in order to make that happen, Sonic Team had to change the series' core gameplay. 
Compared to the last game, movement in general is a lot tighter and more controllable. The spin dash has been nerfed. In SA1 you can spam it indefinitely, but in SA2 you have to specifically hold down the button to rev up. If you just tap it instead, all you'll get is this momentum killer of a somersault. It's inoffensive enough, but it's probably the one aspect of the moveset that I don't care for. But hey, at least Sonic Misty flips out of it. That's cool. Sonic can still run our roll straight off the side of ledges, same as he always could. But when he hits the ledge over a death zone, he automatically puts the brakes on instead of just careening off of it. This is even programmed so that if a platform should move beneath him, he'll be able to walk off of it again. It's really clever how they appropriated something the series has always done to make the game more forgiving in 3D. Most famously, of course, this was the first and only game where Sonic sports those totally fat soap shoes. And yes, these were real shoes you could buy with real money, and they're dumb and dangerous, but I didn't care. I spent my early teens desperately wanting a pair, although if I'd gotten them, I may not be here to tell the tale. But even though Sonic lost the shoes, rail grinding has stuck around, and it's a great fit for the series. What wasn't such a great fit was the upgrade system, which returns here from SA1, with pulsing bracelets, neon green shoe soles, and freaking sunglasses. By the end of the game, the clean designs of the character models are more ruined than ever before. I guess I can give it credit for being a little bit Metroid-y, the way you can take upgrades into previous levels and use them to find even more abilities, but seriously, some of these are pretty freaking superfluous. Look at me, I can turn enemies into little balls. Eh, at least you can mod the PC version to hide the models. But you know, I'll still take the upgrades here, because a fully decked out hedgehog really is something special. The bounce bracelet might seem like a pretty one-note ability that just lets you jump higher, but it ends up raising the skill ceiling once you learn how to apply it. It snaps you downward with a ton of momentum, so it's useful for regaining speed after a jump, and for rocketing into grind rails at max speed. The light speed dash has been upgraded from a start and stop charge move to a single button blast and the homing attack has a teeny tiny cooldown that makes it so much more satisfying. All of Sonic's abilities flow together through the stage design, creating an unprecedented sense of speed driven by a player-controlled tempo. When the GameCube version was released, a lot of department stores had a playable demo of City Escape. By this point, I knew the stage like the back of my hand, and whenever I played it in these public places, it would actually attract a crowd of people. And that speaks volumes about how hard Sonic Adventure 2 could grab your attention, how impressive it looked, and more importantly, how impressive it felt to play it well. In 2001, Sonic Adventure 2 hooked me immediately, and it was all because of these stages. It didn't really matter what the rest of the game was about. I'd have put up with anything to unlock more of them. In fact, by the time I had finished the story, I remember I had already replayed City Escape more than 50 times. It was addictive. It was rewarding. It was a reinvention of Sonic for the modern era. It was like nothing else I'd ever played. But it most definitely wasn't anything like this. And in the long run, I think that's why the game has been so divisive. It draws such a hard line, separating classic from modern. I think it's safe to say that I am good at Sonic games, but the way that I'm good at Sonic 3 feels like a completely different skill set from the way I'm good at Sonic Adventure 2. In SA2, I know the golden path through every stage. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but I know what I need to try to do. Jump, light speed, somersault, spin dash. It's a lot of muscle memory, and my usual response to making a mistake is to restart. The replayability comes from learning each and every beat of a level, and it is positively joyous when you flawlessly execute all of it. And yet the classics, even though they're the part of the series that I've played the most, don't feel like that. What I know here is not a rote memorization of the level design, but the nuances of the physics engine that defines it. I understand the flow of the game. I understand how to thread the needle that is my character, up and down and all around every peak, valley, and obstacle. And by the way, that applied even my first time through Sonic Mania, in stages where I had no familiarity with the layout. I couldn't know what was ahead, but I could anticipate it and react to it in a way that felt like second nature. To this point in the series, going fast was just one approach a player could take. They might also be trying to hoard rings to get into a special stage, or exploring for alternate paths and secrets, or carefully taking their time through an unfamiliar zone, just trying to get to the end. But no matter what approach you took, whether you were trying to or not, over time your skill would sharpen, and you'd gain the ability to tear through zones that used to give you trouble. Being more open to approach is one reason that Classic Sonic still enjoys a more widespread appeal than even the best of the 3D series. 
And early in development, Sonic Adventure was pretty clearly trying to translate that same formula into 3D. A couple of test stages and early concepts have been found over the years, and within them, we see a vision of Sonic Adventure without speed boosters or automation, where the character can make it through loops just by the grace of the physics engine. The problem the developers ran into was that, well, no we can't. At least not consistently. Sonic Adventure is a game that's built on this buggy, unpredictable, imprecise engine, and held together with a lot of duct tape. Yeah, it'll still let you pull off some pretty crazy things, but you're gonna have to learn how not to break it before you can get there. And that's probably why, in Sonic Adventure 2, the focus of the gameplay is not on physics. It's not on earning speed. Sonic Adventure 2 is what the marketing always aspired to. It puts more emphasis than ever on how fast, how skillfully, how spectacularly you made it through a stage, to the point that it even ranks you for it. In contrast to everything that came before, Sonic Adventure 2 is a game about going fast. But unlike a lot of my fellow old farts who grew up with the Genesis, I actually believe that this was the right thing to do. After all, the complex physics that had made the classics what they were couldn't be replicated on hardware of this era, and even if they could, there's just so much more that can go wrong in 3D. So on the flip side, a high-speed spectacle platformer was a natural fit in this perspective, where the sense of momentum is so much greater and the player can see so much further ahead. Sonic Adventure 2 no longer even attempts to be 2D Sonic in 3D, and this comes with a lot of upside. You don't really have to learn your way around the physics of this game, and that alone helps it make a better first impression. Even now, you always see players unfamiliar with the series get stuck in places like this. This just isn't something that would happen with Adventure 2's design philosophy. But I think over the years some downsides have been revealed too. The games in this series that use spectacle as the incentive instead of spectacle as the reward don't age as gracefully. Something like this was an amazing set piece in 2001, but in 1991, so was this. Even though this doesn't impress anymore, it's over in a second, and more importantly, it still has the underlying gameplay to fall back on. But with Sonic Adventure 2, on my billionth time through these stages, I notice I'm spending a lot of time just kinda holding forward while what used to be cool stuff happens. Even as early as City Escape, you can feel a little bit railroaded. I didn't admit this earlier, but the first time I ever played the game, right, I was feeling it. I was in the zone and racing along and, oh yeah, here comes another one of those hairpin turns and... Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. Well, that's a bit of an immersion breaker. Streamlining and simplifying the layouts makes the game more consistent, but it means there's not as much to see off the beaten path, aside from a handful of upgrades and all too brief alternate routes. And look, that's okay, it makes sense. The main focus now is just to blast through a stage and make it awesome, so the design doesn't really need to be as complex, but the trade-off is just that. It's the sole focus, and there's only one right way to play it. But this sort of specialization was a real easy sell to me, because my favorite thing to do in the classics was to try to just speed through everything as fast as I could anyway. And this is not at all to say that Sonic Adventure 2 lacks depth. Certain more recent titles have made the mistake of streamlining to the point of automation, but that's definitely not a fair criticism here. It leans harder on spectacle, sure, but between all the set pieces, there is still a ton of skill mastery to sink your teeth into. But as much as it gelled with me at the time, I definitely think this more speed-focused approach has been done better since, and I get why this isn't what everybody would want their Sonic game to be. Especially because Sonic Adventure 2 is infamously only actually trying to be a Sonic game one-third of the time. What I've talked about up till now is only one of the three gameplay styles, and it is very fortunate that the speed stages stick the landing, because, well, nothing else does. Sonic Adventure 1 had way too many characters for its own good, but the core trio of Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles had a certain resonance. They could all still curl up and let momentum take over, they visited a lot of the same levels, they fought a lot of the same bosses, and they played as iterations on the same core gameplay. In Sonic Adventure 2, each piece of the gameplay trifecta is much more specialized, and each character plays through their own unique stages. This sounds good on paper, and I bet it was a lot easier on the stage designers when they weren't trying to cram multiple character paths into one zone. But in practice, it comes with some consequences. And the most obvious of those is what they've done to Tails. Yes, it's finally time to unpin you, Fox Boy. Tails is the hero side parallel to Eggman, and he spends the whole game confined to a mech, 
This was always such a glaring conceit. Now, yes, Tails is also the brilliant inventor type, so I guess if anybody is going to convert a biplane into a bipedal tank, it's either him or this guy. But it is so counter to why you'd want to play as Tails. And make no mistake, all the way back when we laid eyes on that first trailer, we absolutely did want to play as Tails. Remember, this fandom was a lot younger back then. And there were scores of angry, poorly written message board threads, not to mention emails directed at Sega, screaming at them for even thinking about making a Sonic game without Tails. Well, get out your tinfoil hats, cause I've got a theory. The reveal trailer makes a point to highlight Sonic, Knuckles, and Eggman. Nobody else. So it's always seemed to me that the game might have been meant to feature only these three as playable characters, but during development, Sonic Team decided to, or was forced to, change direction. That same trailer shows Sonic running around in a stage that would ultimately be assigned to Shadow. And by the way, even in the final game, Skyrail's music still matches Sonic's motif and not Shadow's. Here's a pretty enormous piece of evidence, and thanks to main memory for this one. The internal data structure for each gameplay style groups objects into three categories. One named for Sonic, one for Knuckles, and one that's specifically just called Egg Walker. More than anything, of course, if this is true, it explains why Tails would need to be shoehorned into that Egg Walker. Sonic Team didn't have enough time to do it right, but they needed Tails to be a playable character, so this is what we got. The story makes no attempt whatsoever to justify why Tails is in this mech. The characters never remark on it, and he even appears without it in a ton of critical story scenes. Actually, this would go a long way to making an explanation for all the story inconsistencies and presentation problems, considering how hard it would be to cram twice the playable characters into the plot. But hey, that's just a theory. Regardless of how they got there, both Eggman and Tails pilot these ridiculous bipedal mechs. I always thought it was pretty goofy that something this big could nonchalantly bounce around. Their size means the mechs are a bit clunky to control, but it's a well-tuned, appropriate sort of clunkiness that doesn't get in the way. It might look a bit strange, but the actual controls are fine. What holds them back is the level design. Shooting stages tend to have a ton of enemies on screen at once, but that leads to a lot of little projectiles that you can't really dodge because of the mech's size. And instead of relying on the tried and true ring system, Tails and Eggman both have a health bar. I think this was done with purpose. The health bar means you have to take your time and be a little more precise and strategic in taking down enemies. Because if you just ignore them and try to brute force your way through, you'll get overwhelmed. But this invites a comparison to Gamma. You couldn't brute force your way through those stages either because they had a timer that went up when you comboed groups of enemies. Your reward for doing well is leniency, and the consequence if you don't is that you run out of time. But in SA2, the reward for doing well is just points, which is a lot more nebulous. If I were ranking Adventure 1's parade of playstyles, I would say Gamma was the best of the rest. Gamma's stages were better designed with flow in mind, whereas SA2 just features way too much clunky platforming, and even whole sections where you're locked into an elevator ride. It leads to a lot of stages that just overstay their welcome. Now there are some well-executed exceptions, like Cosmic Wall or Mission Street, but even at their worst, the shooting stages are never broken or even necessarily bad. They're just kind of dull and that is not something this series should ever be. So yeah, in conclusion, they somehow took this and made it even less like a Sonic game. But bringing back Emerald Hunting? Now that made a lot more sense. While the rest of Adventure 1 was this overambitious mess of a game, Knuckles' playstyle was something that 3D games had already figured out and excelled at. It was open-world exploration through the unique lens of a Sonic game. The controls have once again been refined for the sequel. They feel more precise, and it's more clear when you disengage from a wall. Speaking of, Knuckles and Rouge can now dig into walls. And really, the best change is that digging is no longer such a momentum breaker. Before, you had to come to a complete stop and hit two buttons to dig. Now you can just jump up into the air and STRIKE LIKE A METEOR INTO THE WEAK, PATHETIC EARTH! Unfortunately, the same unnecessary setbacks that made some of the shooting stages such a chore have also infected the treasure hunting, to such a degree that I think they might actually be worse. In SA1, the radar would ping for any of the three shards in your vicinity, but in SA2, it'll only ring for one at a time. There's just no excuse for nerfing the radar like this, except I guess to make the game last longer. If you happen to find a piece the radar is not pinging for, there's nothing that stops you from picking it up, and it's not like these stages are linear. On the contrary, too often, hunting levels are just over-designed. 
Take Security Hall, for example. The level's split into two sections. The lower path is filled with three layers of vaults that Rouge can dig into to open, and the top path has switches. Each one of these three switches enables you to open one of the three vault layers, but only one switch at a time can be activated. When I played Security Hall, I could tell the first emerald was in a blue vault, so I had to climb up, turn on those vaults, head back down, and open it. Emerald number two was giving me hits from right up here near the ceiling of the first floor, so I knew it had to be on the second level. As fate would have it, it was hidden right next to the switch I had hit earlier, but thanks to the radar nerf, I had no way of knowing that. So now, for emerald number three, I had to go back down, figure out which color vault I needed to open, climb back up for the third time, hit the switch, and... oh no. And this is why the radar nerf hurts so bad. If it still worked like it used to, the more ambitious level design wouldn't have felt so convoluted. On the other hand, if the stages were still as compact and focused as they were in Sonic Adventure 1, the radar nerf wouldn't have been as big a deal. But these two issues together almost ruined treasure hunting. I say almost because of a smattering of really awesome zones like Pumpkin Hill. With its wide open design and so bad it's perfect music, it works for the same reason Red Mountain worked. But a lot of hunting stages lean toward the other end of the spectrum, and the worst of them are just a series of repetitive rooms linked together by boring hallways. So, let's recap. Sonic Team has taken two gameplay styles that worked well in Sonic Adventure, but instead of building on them, they've subtracted from them. They're both worse off than they were before. But they're not let down by the controls or the physics, they're let down by the stage design. Both of these styles have a handful of polished, well-thought-out zones where it all comes together, but as a whole, they're impacted hard by a problem that Sonic has never faced before. A signature of the franchise to this point was the way that every single zone was so distinct from the rest, unique in terms of graphics, set pieces, music, and gimmicks. A lot of other platformers had more levels, but they got there by reusing assets. Even among the myriad of Green Hill knockoffs, it'd be hard to mistake one for another. Sonic 3 stepped it up to another level by making Act 2 a remix of Act 1. And while Sonic Adventure dropped the designation, it took the concept even further. Sonic might start out in a mountainous valley, only to be ripped up by a rampaging tornado. He navigates up and out of it, and the sky-high wreckage is all that remains once the storm passes. Each quote-unquote act even has its own music. The levels of Sonic Adventure might not have been as believable as City Escape, but they were a wonderfully varied set of video game levels with an extremely strong sense of internal progression. This relentless city that never sleeps crescendoed down, way down, into a surprisingly laid-back sunrise. And the still eerie calm of Ice Cap makes its wild, groovy climax even more of a rush. But Sonic Adventure 2 does not do this. Most of its zones are static and unchanging. For the most part, where you start is where you'll finish. Stages don't really iterate on their theme. Oh yeah, themes, that's another issue. The level music in SA2 is defined by which character you're playing as first, and the environment that you're in second. So every Sonic stage has this guitar-driven butt rock, and I love it. Every Knuckles level has cheesy rap music, and I love it. Shadow is associated with this angsty, industrial sound, with lyrics that are mixed way too low to make out. And Rouge has... Uh, whatever this is supposed to be. I couldn't finish her stages fast enough to stop hearing this. Seriously, I do love plenty of these songs, but it means the soundtrack has nowhere near the scope or variety of its predecessor. If I can invoke my Tales theory one more time, this unusual reuse of assets, and the obvious contrast between well-polished stages like this, and awful concepts like this, could just be another result of Sonic Team stretching their game from three characters to six. And if you don't buy into that theory, Maybe it was just because they had to crunch to get it out for the 10th anniversary. Wouldn't be the last time something like that happened. Either way, I always thought it was strange that for as important as he is to the story, Shadow only actually has four levels. Whatever the issue, it led to something the series never, ever had before. Filler. It gets especially noticeable when the story hits the third act, and the whole cast is brought into space. Honestly though, for me personally, I love that aesthetic. Stages like Cosmic Wall and Final Rush are some of my favorites, and the gravity gimmick that a lot of these stages have is a lot of fun. But the point stands, this many stages that all follow the same theme means they just don't stand out as much. Oh yeah, and then the game tries to do this whole planetary gravity thing. Super Mario Galaxy pulled it off, but that was still six years away. Ugh, <sighs> unfettered ambition. 
years before it's technically feasible. This really is a Sega game. Like with everything else, there are cases where the potential of this approach is realized. Ideally, each hero's side stage would have a strikingly dark counterpart, which would be a thematically perfect replacement for the multi-act structure. A great example of this is Sonic's Green Forest, contrasted with Shadow's White Jungle, or City Escape, compared to Radical Highway. These levels are like two sides of the same coin, but there's no mistaking one for the other. The emblem system from the last game has seen a substantial improvement. Every stage now has five missions to complete instead of just three, and each mission now ranks the player. As long as the stage is fun, the missions are too. They might introduce a time limit, or even rework the layout and enemy placement to be more challenging. On the other hand, the mission to collect 100 rings is a bit arbitrary, and the one where you have to find a lost chow is... Eh, well, it's not exactly conducive to the speed stages in particular to scour an entire stage for this weird little object, which opens up a new path when you, uh, play a magic light flute at it. Oh, and before you can even do that, you also have to find the appropriate upgrade for every character individually. But hey, maybe if you like 3D exploration for its own sake, more than I do, you'll get more out of it. Giving the player more optional stuff to do, and ranking how well they did it, was definitely a great addition. Anything that improves replayability is a win in my book. Let's talk about the hint system. SA1 had these light balls representing the soul of Tikal. SA2 has... Omo Chow! I knew you'd come! But you know what? He's actually not as bad as I remembered. I think I might have been conflating his later appearances with this one. Cause he'd eventually start chiming in whether you wanted him to or not. But here he turns out to be well placed enough that you're unlikely to hit him unless you want to. Yeah, his voice is a little grating, but given that you can do this... I think Sonic Team was in on the joke. Hey, it's not like he's the only much maligned character who keeps hilariously popping up where he doesn't belong. But speaking of Omocho, I guess if I'm ever gonna do this, this'll be my last chance. <sighs> the Chow Garden was a concept first introduced in Sonic Adventure 1. Well, technically it was kind of an offshoot of the Nitopian system from Nights into Dreams, but there it was so subtle and understated that I don't think anybody knows how it works. In Adventure 2, the Chow Garden sees a lot of refinement. There's a slew of new animals that raise stats and change a Chow's appearance, and gun robots drop Chaos Drives, which can raise stats without changing appearance. Neat! The new system even incorporates the Hero vs. Dark theme. Chow will take on different characteristics depending on the alignment of the characters that raise them. There are also two new unlockable gardens based around either theme. I also really like the way you access the Chow Garden now. You can do it through the menu, yeah, or you can find a Chow key somewhere within each stage. Then when you beat the level, your character automatically gets transported there. So as you progress through the story or work on missions, you can choose to take regular breaks to check in on the Chow. It's a good place to relax and unwind and I'd sometimes go in here just to get a few minutes playing as Tails without the mech. But despite all the improvements, well... Mechless Tails was really the only reason I ever came here. I think the reason I got into it for a while in the first game was because of the VMU connectivity. By 2001, the novelty had worn off and all my batteries had died. Oh yeah, and also the online component, which was such a big part of the appeal in Adventure 1, was completely left out of the sequel. The GameCube version was actually the first game on that system that had GBA connectivity. And that was neat and all, but come on. If I've got a Game Boy Advance right there, I'm just gonna feel like I'm wasting my time doing this. But you know, that's just me. I know a lot of players really love the Chow. The mode itself is so counter to the gameplay of the series, but I'll give it credit because it does definitely encourage replayability through the stages, and that's the important thing. Still, the only reason it came to be in the first place is because Adventure 1 needed to show off every single thing the Dreamcast could do, but nowadays, I'd prefer they just put development resources into making a better Sonic game. Oh yeah, you did still have to win Chow races to earn a few emblems. I did everything else legit, but I kept putting this off, and my procrastination was rewarded when this legendary Chow editor program for the VMU was released that fall. You better believe I put that thing to use. This game had 180 emblems to collect, compared to 130 in the first game. When you got them all in Sonic Adventure, your reward was... nothing whatsoever. So this is another case where Adventure 2 seizes an opportunity for improvement. Because when you get them all here, this icon appears on the stage select. Nobody knew about this for a few weeks after release, and even now the game keeps it a secret, right up until it shows you this. Oh my god, this was cool. 
Look, nowadays Green Hill Zone has been driven into the ground over and over and over and over again, but games back then almost never played on nostalgia like this. What really brings it home are the details. The musical remix is still evocative of Adventure 2 style. In this stage only, Sonic regains his old jump sound effect, and the layout is a match for Green Hill Act 1, but in 3D. That means it also serves as an example of why that old approach wouldn't have worked from this perspective. The ramps don't really feel right, you automatically get pushed through the loop, and some boost pads and launchers had to be implemented to keep things steady. It's an example of how the adventure era could no longer just rely on physics. Nonetheless, especially in this game that did so much to reinvent Sonic, this was a wonderful reward for a dedicated player, a fitting love letter to the past, and a perfect tribute for the 10th anniversary. One of the few things that characters do sometimes share are boss fights, and there are three tiers. First, you've got the character versus character battles, which are nominally better than they were in Adventure 1, but that's not really saying much. Really, though, they're fine, and given the game's hero versus dark theme, it'd be weird if they weren't there. Later in the game, they happen again, but this time the AI is better and you fight in different environments. These are a little more interesting. Knuckles and Rouge have this vertical battlefield, Sonic and Shadow have a never-ending highway, and Tails and Eggman have... well, they fight again, but with an explodey thing this time. The second tier are the battles against gun military fighters. These might not be anything to write home about, but they're over fast, and I like that you fight them as different types of characters. I was always intrigued by this text scroll. I couldn't make out a single word without a VGA box, and it scrolls by way too fast to read. But it's another one of those flourishes, those fully fleshed out details that didn't need to be there. <sighs> now I miss the old Sonic team again. Far and away, the best of the bosses, though, are the unique enemy encounters. The Egg Golem has a great design and a fun gimmick, and I love the way the fight gets harder as it goes on. After Sonic damages the control unit, the Egg Golem turns on its creator, and it's awesome to see the same fight through the lens of a totally different type of character. Shadow fights the Bio Lizard, and this one's a little more tedious, but I do appreciate the sheer size of this thing and the way it incorporates rail grinding. But the best fight in the game, and... Man, one of my favorites in the whole series is Knuckles' battle against King Boom Boo. This guy has a design and a voice that are unforgettable, and the strategy it takes to beat him is really clever. This boss fight incorporates all of Knuckles' abilities, and it's another instance where the potential of the specialized gameplay pays off. Ooh, and I really wouldn't be doing this game justice if I didn't talk about this. Nothing. Nothing was more awesome than the finale where you play this epic length stage with a really novel time-freezing gimmick that combines all three gameplay styles. The whole cast reaches the core of the arc, and then Sonic and Shadow finally set aside their differences and team up to take down the Bio-Lizard. See, it's this monster that's a prototype of Shadow, I think, right? All that really mattered was that this giant lizard monster has shoved the Space Colony arc up its butt and directed it on a collision course with Earth. It's time for our heroes to turn into Super Sonic and Super Shadow to save the world! As a final boss, gameplay-wise, this is no perfect chaos, and its mechanics from how you damage it to its attacks to especially the character swapping are all poorly explained and repetitive. But it's more than made up for by the sheer tenacity of that song and the sheer tension of the aesthetic. <sighs> I... I still love this. I've always loved this. The oh-so-cheesy way their eyes open, the coolness factor of their power auras and a flying around through 3D space, and oh god do I ever love that theme song. The reason that Live and Learn kicks your teeth down your throat so hard is the way that it's teased throughout the game. You'll hear the instrumental every time you hit the title screen. If you're playing Battle, you'll hear just a hint of it in the intro. It's even foreshadowed in City Escape. So when you finally get here for the first time, you hear that wildly passionate opening verse, and you realize just as the chorus drops that, oh, this is the same song I've been hearing this whole time. Look, I confess, maybe my musical taste is a bit one-dimensional. It was forged by Power Rangers music, with its ridiculous lyrics and abundant rock guitars, but I'm not ashamed to admit this. Live and Learn is not just one of my favorite video game songs, it is one of my favorite songs, full stop. I loved Sonic Adventure 2 in 2001, it challenged me, it redefined my perceptions of the series, and it absolutely blew away my very high expectations. As I saw those credits roll for the first time, I felt like I had finished a true epic. 
and a game that was destined to be one of my all-time favorites. And yet it was bittersweet to think that we few Dreamcast owners would be the only ones that would ever experience it. Of course, that's not the way it went. On either count, Sonic Adventure 2 became the game that made the next generation of Sonic fans, and it would be loved by millions. But somewhere along the way, I stopped counting myself among them. I mean, I can't even tell you the name of every zone. I could do that for all the others to this point. Yeah, I never stopped playing the speed stages, but the game as a whole was so much less than the sum of its parts, and in the long run, I guess it just didn't make as much of an impression. But then again, how could it? I was no longer as impressionable. This was the first game in the series that I never played during my childhood, because I couldn't have. Yeah, I was only 13, but still, my freaking voice had already changed. I was just barely too old to really have that kind of all-encompassing childhood nostalgia for Sonic Adventure 2. Maybe the fact that I was on that precipice is why writing this video has felt pretty disjointed. There have been times where I feel like I've finally got my finger on the core of everything that's wrong with Sonic Adventure 2, but then I always get pulled back and enthralled by one of the many things that I love about it. The truth is, even after everything I've said, I still can't give you an easy summary of how I feel about this game. Yeah, maybe that's also why it's turned out to be so long. It's like I'm arguing with myself. But it's also because the game itself is disjointed. Flip-flopping between disparate gameplay styles, never really staying at a thrilling high or a frustrating low for more than a few minutes. There's a lot that I love about it, but I wonder sometimes if I judge it more harshly now because of how aware I am of the lessons that Sonic Team took from its success. I've spent a great deal of time in this critique comparing Sonic Adventure 2 to its predecessors, especially this one, and, you know, of course I'm gonna do that. For me, Sonic Adventure 2 was the 10th anniversary of what had always been my favorite franchise. It was the direct sequel to a game that I loved, and I saw it as another thread in the long tapestry of the series. But for that next generation, Sonic Adventure 2 might as well have not even had a 2 in the title. They had no frame of reference for what Tails was supposed to be, how different the game was, the things that had been lost, or what had been gained. For them, Sonic Adventure 2 came first, and people have a lot of affection for things that they see as coming first. I don't hate this game, but I vehemently disagree with this notion that it was the last time the series was any good, as if this was the one and only time they ever made it work in 3D, and oh, if only Sega made them like this again, then Sonic can be saved. When I know, I remember it being such a strikingly divisive game right from the start. I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody a little younger than me say something like, Dude, when I was a kid, I loved Sonic 2 Battle Adventure! But you know, the fact that these people were so young when they played it, that they can't even really remember the name, is just an indication of the misconception I talked about way back at the start of this episode. If you played Sonic Adventure 2, Battle, when you were a kid, I'm sure you do remember everyone you knew loving it back then. And it's possible that some of your base gaming memories were formed with it. And now here comes a bunch of curmudgeonly old dudes to try to ruin it and say, No, your childhood was wrong and your memories are lying to you. All bow to 16-bit. These are the only real good Sonic games. Sonic has been so many things. Too many things. Each and every one of those things has grown its own subset of the fandom. But unlike a lot of people, I have loved at least a game or two in every era this series has been through. This fandom would be a lot better off if we made more of an effort to accept that other people might enjoy aspects of the series that don't work for us, and I think we should try to understand and appreciate that perspective instead of taking it personally. After all, there is a clunky, awkward, horribly aging Sonic game that I am very nostalgic for. It's the last one that I did get to play when I was still a kid. And year over year, I find more affection for it. I also remind myself that for a lot of people, and a lot of you, Sonic Adventure 2 was your first exposure to this series. It defined and shaped your expectations for what Sonic should be, and it may have even been the first video game you ever loved. Just like a certain other game with a 2 in the title was for me. The speed focus gameplay that really gelled with me got carried forward, and it took a long time, but that part did eventually get done better.
but everything else about Sonic Adventure 2 just hasn't really been attempted for over a decade now. Because as refreshing, well-executed, and contemporary as it was in the early 2000s, most of the things that defined this game would soon be driven like a stake right through the heart of the franchise. This would lead directly to Sonic's Darkest Hour, a perfect series of errors and miscalculations that would poison his reputation for generations to come. And because of that, the series survived only by eliminating almost everything that made the adventure era what it was. That, I'm sure, just makes this game even more revered. So for those who yearn for a greater focus on story, for a more serious take on the franchise, for an epic scope with higher stakes, for a varied cast of playable characters, for those who want nothing more than the return of the Chow Garden, for each and every one of you still dreaming of Sonic Adventure 3, I get it. I'd be interested to see how it's done, and I think it could be done. But next week, it's time to turn down the story focus, ratchet the cast of characters way too high, and learn about the real superpower of teamwork! I'll be covering... <sighs> Sonic Heroes! You can see that episode and the entire rest of this season right now via my Patreon. Thanks to all of them for the support, thank you to everyone for watching, and until next time, you keep geeking, I'll keep critiquing.